Well, the Almighty be praised today. Grateful for another opportunity to share in the teaching of the Scriptures. The Most High is so good to us, giving us His Son, Yeshua, our King, our Deliverer, our Savior, the one who has gone before the very throne of the Almighty, throne of the Father, and gave his own blood for our redemption. So grateful for that. And today, as we get into the teaching in the latter part of Romans chapter 3, we're going to be talking a little bit more about that redemption. We touched uh, a little bit on it last week in the second or the first portion, so shall I say, of uh, Romans chapter 3 verses 1 through 20. Today we're going to be looking at Romans the uh, third chapter, but we're going to look at verse 21 and we're going to read through to the end of that third chapter. And uh, what I love about this section of scripture is that the writer, the Apostle Paul, he makes it very plain and showing the distinction between how justification or our being made righteous is solely determined by what the Most High has done for us in the providing of redemption. As you know, uh, those who heard the teaching last week when we were dealing with Romans 3 verses 1 through 20, we made it very clear that the deeds of Torah or the doing or the obedience to the commandments does not produce redemption because the purpose of obeying the commandments is to abstain from committing sin and it is to keep us in a blessed place as it pertains to our relationship with the Most High. But it has never been the intent of the Father that keeping the commandments or doing the Torah is to serve the purpose of redemption. And this is the thing that we really need to understand based upon what Paul is saying. And so, as we get into this latter part of chapter 3, uh, we're going to look at it a little bit further and uh, really clear up some things so that we can understand, as the people of the Most High, we're supposed to keep the commands of the Father. We're supposed to do what the Torah says. But we do what the Torah says so that we can maintain the blessings of the covenant in our lives, so that we might live the life of holiness, so that we might know what sin is and what sin is not. We learned last week that the Torah is the knowledge of sin. In other words, the purpose, one of the aspects of Torah, one of the aspects of purposes of Torah is to reveal to us what sin is. So if Torah is revealing to us what sin is, then quite obviously the obeying of the Torah and the keeping of the commandments will cause us to be in a position where we are abstaining from committing sin. And that's what the Father wants us to do, something that he wants us to do. But we need to understand if we sin, we have to go to the blood. We must have the blood for our redemption. Now, uh, let's go right into uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of Elohim, apart from the Torah, is manifested, being witnessed or being made known, witnessed by the Torah and the prophets. Torah and the prophets is just a phrase which refers to the scriptures. Even the righteousness of Elohim by faith 
of Yeshua the Messiah unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of Elohim, being justified gratuitously or freely by his grace through the redemption that is in the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, verse 25, I want to spend some time a little later on um, explaining this, but I'm just going to read the translation here. It says, For Elohim hath set forth a propitiation through faith in his blood. Literally, it should read that Elohim, or whom, talking about the Messiah, the Messiah, whom Elohim set forth to be, it says, a propitiation through faith in his blood. The uh, literal definition or literal translation is whom Elohim hath set before the mercy seat. And I'm, I'm going to get into that later because that's what it's really talking about from the Greek. It says, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of Elohim. To declare at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Yeshua. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified or made righteous by faith without the deeds of the Torah. Is Elohim only the Elohim of the Yehudians or the Jews? Is he not also of the nations? Yes, of the nations also. Seeing only one Elohim which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Verse 31, do we then make the Torah of none effect through faith? May it never be so. We establish the Torah. Blessed be his great name. Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and your goodness and for the opportunity to be able to teach the scriptures today. We ask that you would give us the inspiration of your Ruach and cause us to be able to share the scripture with clarity, with power. May those who hear the teaching be enlightened, encouraged, and edified. And may they be able to stand on these truths that righteousness comes only through the blood sacrifice and that the Torah is given for the purpose of holy living. May we understand those truths that you have revealed to us and never mix the two. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, we bless the Almighty for these scriptures and the revelation that we obtain from these scriptures. As the writer here, the Apostle Paul, continues in his letter in this third chapter. He's phasing over from dealing with how salvation comes not by the doing of what the Torah says, but through faith. You know, it's interesting, anytime you make a statement such as that, because of the teaching and the preaching that has 
been transmitted throughout the centuries by those who understand their faith from a Western perspective, or should I say from a Greek and Roman perspective, there is this downplay on the Torah and the Torah's place in the life of the believer. And as we look at this section, it's so important that I emphasize again the distinction that the apostle is making in the writing. First of all, we do need to understand that the apostle is not saying that the Torah or the commandments and all of the teachings that the Almighty gave first through Adam and then revealed again to Moses because man in his uh, downfall into paganism forgot the way of the Most High. That same teaching or Torah which uh, King David said is established in the heavenlies. Uh, the Apostle Paul did not in any way, shape, or form say that it has been completely removed or is obsolete and has no purpose in the life of the believer at all. And as we get into this teaching, we're going to find out, especially as we uh, deal with the last verse in this chapter, how the apostles' uh, feeling about this really is. Because so oftentimes we mistake what the apostle says when he says that you are not justified or you are not made righteous by doing what the Torah says. See, the reason why you're not made righteous by doing what the Torah says is because the purpose of the Torah is not to cleanse you of your sins and make you innocent. That's not the purpose of the Torah. The only way that a person who is found guilty of sin, the only way that a person can be made righteous is by the substitutionary sacrifice of a clean, a, a sacrifice that is set apart, that is unblemished that is acceptable, that is innocent. Something innocent has to die for that which is guilty. That's the plan of the Father. And in the process of that, blood has to be spilled. For the scripture teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission and no atonement for sin. So the purpose of Torah it's not for atonement. It's not for redemption. It's not for cleansing the person of their sins. So we need to understand that right off the bat. For those who don't understand those concepts, they tend to confuse the purpose of the Torah and how much teaching is presented today. When the Apostle Paul makes these statements, they take it to mean that, oh, the Torah now has no place in the life of the believer because it does not make us righteous. No, it doesn't make us righteous. We're made righteous through the spilling of the blood. That's always been the mode of the Father. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, when Adam sinned, I want you to see the concept here. When Adam sinned, Adam tried to cover his shame with fig leaves. But the Most High took animals, slaughtered them, spilled blood, and took the coats that he had created from the skins of the animals and covered Adam and Eve's shame. The example provided is that by the spilling of the blood, sin is now covered. The atonement means to cover. It's to cover the sin. Is to cover the shame. And so the Most High presented this concept way back in the time of Adam. And that has always been the method 
for making someone righteous. And so as we continue in the text here, what we're going to find from verse 21, it says now, notice, it says that but now the righteousness of Elohim is apart from the Torah or it's not based on the Torah and it is manifested or witnessed in the Torah and the prophets. So I got a little bit ahead of myself in saying a little something about uh, how that in the time of Adam, we find that the blood sacrifice was revealed as the method by which sin would be pardoned and atoned for. See, Paul here in this 21st verse, he's continuing with the thought saying that justification has no connection with what you do based upon your obedience. Your obedience does not provide you with the redemption, justification, or atonement. So anytime we hear the word justification, the first thing that you need to do is note that it is synonymous, justification or righteousness or being made righteous is synonymous with atonement, redemption. It's synonymous with those concepts when it has to do with being made righteous. There's a difference between being made righteous and then living out a righteous life through obedience. That's the practical holiness. Is the living out of holiness. See, you can't make yourself righteous. Only the Most High can make you righteous. And once He makes you righteous through redemption, then He commands us to now live and walk out a righteous life by obeying what the Torah says. Hope that makes sense. But Paul here, he says, but now righteousness or the righteousness of Elohim apart from the Torah has been made known in the scriptures, in the Torah and the prophets. Now what Paul wants to do is to point now to the scriptures to make known to his audience that he is writing to that this whole concept of being made righteous without Torah being a part of it is something that is scripturally based. And what Paul wants to do is point to the concept of the atonement. As I made mention uh, a little earlier with reference to, when I say earlier, I'm talking about in previous lessons. Uh, when I, when I uh, talked about the basis for Paul taking time to deal with this concept is because of the embracing of this idea that the doing and the keeping of the Torah would serve as a substitute for the sacrifices and the offerings. I want us to be mindful of that. This whole concept of Torah bringing justification in the lives of people is all based upon what the elders decided to do when they didn't have a temple. They were in Babylonian captivity and they did not have the temple anymore to go to, to be able to offer sacrifices so that they could receive atonement or redemption. None of that could be done. So they had to figure out a way in order to have their sins removed. So they decided we will use the obedience to the Torah as a substitute for atonement. That will be our redemption now, the Torah. So they put the Torah in a place and they looked at the Torah and set it as being now the means of redemption. When that was never the purpose of the Father at all. It was never his intention to use Torah as a means of redemption. Torah is the way of holiness. Torah has always been what teaches us the difference between righteous living and unrighteous living. And it has to remain in that purpose. We have to see it in that light as being its purpose. And so Paul 
Paul, in his writing, he says that in the scriptures, the scriptures make it very clear that you can become righteous without doing what the Torah says. Now, is Paul saying, don't do what the Torah said? No, he's not saying that. He's making a point. I want us to catch this. He's making a point. Because he's dealing with people who have this mindset that if they obey the Torah, they will have redemption. That's a dangerous concept to have. I want, I want you to catch, catch why I said that. Why is it such a dangerous concept to have? Because if only through my obeying of the commandments, I can receive atonement and forgiveness of sins, then what that says is that there's no need for the blood sacrifice of the Messiah that was given to pay the price for the world's redemption. See, that's a dangerous concept. And the Apostle Paul understood what the consequences would be for those who would embrace that concept. If all it took was for me to live a godly, holy life by obeying Torah, and not look to the Messiah, Yeshua, for my salvation through faith in his redemptive plan, then I would be on my way to hell. You say, for reals? Yes, for reals. Because even though the Most High has given us his commandments, and, and he's given that to us because he wants us to follow it, and yes, when we break it, we commit sin. If we miss the most important thing, and that is the way back to right standing with the Father. If we miss his provision that it came through the blood sacrifice and the blood sacrifice of his son, the Messiah Yahshua, is the fullness of that plan and purpose. If we miss that. We don't even have fellowship with the Father. All of our holiness, or what we call holiness, all of our obedience is absolutely meaningless. It's like putting the cart before the horse. You're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> and so the Apostle Paul is trying to set the record straight in the minds of those that he is teaching and discussing this subject with because he wanted them to understand that we don't want to provide or embrace any kind of teaching that will take away from the redemptive plan of the Father. We don't want to embrace anything that would undercut or undermine the, the, the power of the redemption that we have through the Messiah. Now I believe wholeheartedly in keeping every detail of the Torah. Because the Messiah said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The most I said over in Deuteronomy 28, that if you keep my covenant indeed and be diligent to keep all of these commandments, then all these blessings will come upon you. But the thing that we need to understand is that when the Father made that statement, the people had already been brought into covenant with Him. Back at that time, there was the blood sacrifice of the animals. And all of that had occurred. The people had repented. The people had went through water immersion. The people had the blood sprinkled upon them by Moses. The people had already become righteous through the, the shadow, if I could use that, that represented the Messiah being the one that would bring redemption. And after they had become the people of Elohim, after they had their sins forgiven and atoned for through the method that the Most High used back during the time of Moses, what we find is that he said, now if you keep my covenant indeed, all these blessings will come upon you. So why am I saying that? Because there's a pattern. You must first be made righteous. And then live obediently to the Most High. 
See, if you haven't been made righteous yet, then your strivings and my strivings of trying to be obedient to the Father is meaningless because we have no relationship. We have no covenant. We have no connection. And the Apostle Paul wanted to make it plain. He said, look, you guys that are believing this, you got to understand. You that are under the law, this is the phrase he used, under the law. We talked about uh, in, in our last teaching that the phrase under the law is just another way of saying that the law is covering you or the law is providing you with atonement. When we see the word atonement, the word atonement is from the Hebrew word kippur. Kippur literally means to cover. All right? It means to cover. So to be under the law, quote unquote, was a phrase that everybody understood during that time, which meant that the Torah is your atonement. It was used as their means of salvation, their means of redemption, their means of having sins put aside. It was not something that the Most High had created. It was something that men created. And what's interesting, you know, anytime you get in a position where you feel like, oh, I don't know what to do now. How are we going to be able to fix this situation? Man wants to get involved and try to figure out on his own how he is going to have atonement. They should have just left it alone because as soon as they introduced this concept of righteousness and atonement by doing what the Torah said, they just confused the whole matter. Now, we have just about 90% of what we call the uh, Christian community that believes in some concept or another that the Torah is not for the believer. Some use the Torah just as a means of uh, trying to establish their own righteous system or system of holiness that they'll live by. And they'll, they'll pick and choose which commandments they want to if they believe that tithing uh, is, is a necessity because, you know, in, in our day to day, you know, most most uh, religious leaders love that money. <laughs> I'm just going to be real with it. Most believers love that money. They'll, they'll say, we're not under the law, we're under grace, but they'll tell you that you need to tithe and they'll go read Malachi 3. <laughs> they'll tell you that you need to give, but they fail to realize, I mean, I hope they realize it, but, you know, tithing is a part of the Torah. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll preach and teach heavily on sexual immorality, and, and I mean preach it and preach it as hard as can be. But everything the scripture says about sexual immorality is in the Torah. But they won't, you know, bother when it comes to diet or anything like that. Because, you know, of course, that's under the law. All of the things that religious leaders that call themselves people of Elohim that they're teaching is found in the Torah. They just pick and choose what they want to follow. Because they're concerned about what's going to work for them. And, and, and most definitely what's going to make sure that, that uh, keep the coffers filled. Because you got to have that money coming in. Everybody say amen to that. They all say amen to that. <laughs> but when we look at this, we need to understand that the apostle is by no means saying that the Torah has no place in the life of the believer. But what he emphasizes is that this righteousness comes to us by means of the atonement. I love the way Paul brings this. And what I want to do right now, I want to focus on verse 24 and 25. Verse 24 and verse 25 is what I want to focus on. And uh, in most, it seems like in most uh, Bible translations, it's not brought out as, as plain and as accurate as it should. You know, I mean, I have a number of translations that I, I read, uh, King James, NIV, and uh, New Revised Standard Versions, you know, there are a number of translations that I read from. But in my teaching... I'm teaching from the interlinear Greek. So I have the Greek 
in front of me with the literal translation underneath it. And so when we teach from this translation, we're able to get a lot of the nuggets out, things that you don't always see when you just read a translation. But let's go to verse 24. I'm going to read verse 24 and 25. Here, uh, you know, Paul, after he gets finished talking about that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of Elohim, because he wanted to make it clear that there's nobody on the planet that's better than anyone else. There's no one that has an upper hand when it comes to righteousness than anyone else. No, everyone has sinned. Everyone's messed up. And it doesn't matter whether you are a descendant of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov or not. You are a sinner just as well as those of the nations. You may know what Torah says. You may know the will of Elohim. But, you know, until you receive Messiah, Yahshua, you are still classified in that pot of those who were called sinners. But after he says that, verse 24, he says, being justified freely by his grace. Notice, he says, through the redemption, Paul talks about, he talks about, how we obtain this righteousness is what? Through the redemption that is in the Messiah, Yahshua. Now, check this out in verse 25. He talks about the redemption that is in the Messiah, Yahshua. And now I'm going to just kind of translate this as plain as I can. I got to say it all together when it talks about that. We have received this redemption. Talks about this redemption that is in the Messiah Yahshua, whom Elohim set forth before the mercy seat. Literally, literally in the Greek, when you read this, what Paul is saying is that. We receive this redemption, and this redemption has come to us in the Messiah Yahshua, whom Elohim placed before the mercy seat. The phrase in the scriptures where it says set before literally also means placed before, and that word that's been translated in other places as propitiation. It's, it's a Greek word here, and that Greek word here is called illustrion, almost like saying illustrious, but it's illustrion. This word literally means mercy seat, and you know when you think about the mercy seat, the mercy seat is illustrious. <laughs> this mercy seat the Messiah has been placed before. In other words, in, in giving us this redemption, Elohim placed the Messiah before the mercy seat. So what does that mean? That he was placed before the mercy seat. Anyone who knows anything about this statement knows that an individual who came before the mercy seat Came in order to perform the service of the atonement. Only one person could come before the mercy seat. And that was the high priest. One person. When the tabernacle stood and the temple stood. You had all of the priests. They offered sacrifices. On the altar outside of the tabernacle or temple. You had those priests that would come into the first compartment of the tabernacle or temple and they would make sure that they would take care of the lighting of the altar of incense and the lighting of the menorah, keeping it trimmed rather, keeping it filled with oil so that the, 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 uh, the lamps on the menorah would burn continuously. But only one person could go behind the curtain to go into the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was the high priest. None of the other priests could do that. But the scriptures here is saying that Elohim has set, he has placed Messiah before the mercy seat. It's another way of saying is that he has placed Messiah 
to be the one that would perform the act of atonement with his own blood. Now I'm going to continue reading. Check this out what it says. I want you to catch this. It says, whom Elohim hath placed before the mercy seat through faith in his blood. He's saying that now what we must do is put our faith in what? His blood. Messiah comes before the mercy seat. Just as the high priest would come before the mercy seat. That's the top part of the Ark of the Covenant where the cherubim, those angels, had their wings outstretched which symbolized that the presence of the Almighty would be covered. The high priest would come to the mercy seat and sprinkle the blood of the slaughtered animal seven times. And when Messiah died, the scripture teaches us that he ascended into the heavens and stood before the mercy seat, the very throne of the Father, and sprinkled his own blood seven times. See, this is the redemption. And we are told to have faith in his blood. Now, Paul is going over all of this because he wants us to understand that righteousness, or being made righteous, being justified comes as a result of the atoning blood sacrifice. Paul wanted to make it very clear that the scriptures attest to the fact that being made righteous comes totally separate from the Torah or doing what it says because its basis is upon the mercy of the Almighty. That's why his seat is called the mercy seat. It's called the mercy seat when atonement is made. Because when atonement is made, mercy is dispensed to those who are called sinners. And their status then changes from being a sinner to now being a saint. Their status changes now from being one who was guilty to now one who has been made innocent through the blood of Messiah's sacrifice. Powerful. Powerful. So we see Messiah now before the mercy seat making atonement and redemption for our sins and not just ours but for the sins of the whole world. And so as we continue on looking in the rest of this chapter, you know, the Apostle Paul continues to make this uh, clarification that the Father is not partial. You know, there are no favorites that Elohim has. You know, he used this terminology where he says, you know, there, there, there's one Elohim that's making the Judeans righteous or making the blood descended Israelites righteous and that same Elohim that's making those of the nations righteous who believe through faith. He says, for those of the circumcision who come to Messiah through faith or by faith, he says it's the same Elohim that's making those of the nations, commonly called Gentiles, righteous through faith. Same Elohim. That's not a different Elohim working with the nations and a different Elohim working with the Israelites. No. Same Elohim. Only one. Only one. Same one. And he's not partial. He's provided atonement. For the whole world. And I love the fact that he's made atonement for the whole world. So important that we that we catch this. Now, the last verse is the one I want to look at because here in this verse is where Paul wants to make sure that the people that he is writing to don't get certain things twisted. You, you know, we human beings, we, we, have a, we have a way of wanting to always make sure that we fix things and see things that suits our preference. You know, because we human beings, we like sin. 
We do. We like sin. We know what the scriptures teach us. We know what it says. But the real deal is that we would rather follow the bent of our proclivities. We'd rather follow what we want to do, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. If it feels good to us, we're like, hey, you know what? Let's, let's figure out a way to, to somehow see the picture in a way in which we don't really have to deal with the reality that comes upon sin. People like to deceive themselves. They really do. It amazes me. And we feel like that if we can take the holy book and somehow tweak it just a little so that it fits our perspective, we then convince ourselves that we could do certain things and be justified or made righteous in it. But look at what Paul says in the last verse. Because it, it almost appears as if Paul is trying to really downplay the Torah because he's talking about faith being what's necessary to be made righteous and to be saved and redeemed. He lays such heaviness upon the concept of that. And rightly so. But because of the people that he's talking to, they still think that, oh, the Torah is our means of salvation. So since that's not our means of salvation now, then I guess we just throw it away. It's not effective anymore, right? Not so. Look at the 31st verse. Check this out. Paul says, do we then make the Torah of none effect? That's how it reads in the Greek. <laughs> he says, the Torah, do we make of none effect? He says, no, never shall it be. Now, when your King James translation, it uses the phrase, God forbid. We see that in the translation. The phrase, God forbid, is not in the Greek. So if you have... A King James translation just crossed that out because it's not there. Bet y'all didn't know that, did you? Most people reading your King James Version translations and you're hailing that the King James Version is the best translation. You just cross it out. It's not there in the Greek. The Greek phrase is, may it never be. God forbid it's just an old English phrase which means let it never happen. That's all it is. They did that kind of stuff when they were translating the scriptures. Just that most of us don't know it and we, we look at these scriptures and we think these translations that we have are so great and we want to praise the translations. You need to go back and understand the Hebrew and the Greek. I thought I'd just throw that in there. That's why I teach from the Greek interlinear translation so that we might be able to understand the scriptures accurately and not continue promoting something that can lead to confusion. What Paul says is that do we take the Torah and cancel it? Do we take the Torah and make it void? Do we take the Torah and make it of none effect? He said, no, never let it happen. Never let it be. Or never let this idea even come into existence. That's the idea of it that is mentioned. He says, but rather it's this. He says, through faith, we take the Torah and we establish it. Through faith, we make the Torah stand up. And I want to tell you this, this Greek word real quick. You probably say, well, I don't know Greek. Yeah, you might not know Greek, but it's good to start learning something because when you find out the definition of these terms, it helps you to have a greater understanding, a greater picture of what is being written here. It says here in this particular passage, it says that we cause Torah to be Estonian. Estonian means to establish or to cause it to stand. It's like taking a big pillar attaching it to a foundation in the ground and then putting the Torah up on top of the pillar and showing it to everyone. We uphold it. We make it stand. We declare it. We make it big before the nations so everybody can see it. 
Do we get rid of it? No, we don't get rid of it through faith. Through faith, we establish it. That's why David said, Forever, O Yahuwah, your word is established in the heavens. And since it is established in the heavens, Paul here says, through faith, we are establishing it here on the earth. Did not Messiah say it? As it is in heaven, so it is where? In the earth. In the earth. And so it's important that we understand Paul was never eliminating the Torah. When he taught, he never had in mind to produce an idea that the Torah would be thrown in the trash can. That's a concept that Greco-Roman Catholic teaching has presented to us. It has handed down to us. But it is not the original Messianic Israelite concept that Messiah gave to us. The faith once delivered to the saints. It is not the original faith. The original faith teaches us that salvation comes through the redemptive sacrifice of the Messiah and through the grace provided alone. But Torah is the pattern and the lifestyle of holiness. That's why we're told in Hebrews 12, 14, where it says, follow, follow, follow. When you read that, that, that verse is given to people who have already been made righteous. So you, you have to be made righteous first. You have to be saved first. And then you're commanded to live godly. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Without which no one shall see Yahuwah. See, the holiness is the lifestyle we live now because we're in covenant. But guess what? Even though you've been made righteous, and some may disagree with this point, but even though you may have been made righteous, if you walk in sin and continue in sin, you can be cut off from the Father. Now, I know that's a hard one for some to take because there are those who believe that once you in, you in, and there's no getting out of the, of the family. Well, that's not what the Word says. The Word talks about some folks whose names are removed from the book of life. The scriptures in some places, it teaches us about being considered a castaway. In some places, the scriptures talk about being turned over to Satan, being put out of the family. I know those are hard things to accept and embrace, but the way of holiness is the lifestyle of the believer because we are now in covenant with the Almighty. And so it's important as believers that we do not look at Torah and think that, oh well, it's not for me. No, it's for you. It's for me. And it's not just for you and for me. It's for the whole world. Torah is for the whole world. Why do I say that Torah is for the whole world? Because one day, on the last day, the Father is going to judge the world with his Torah, his teaching. And if he's going to use his Torah to judge the world, and quite obviously, the doing and keeping of the Torah is of some significance. It might not be our redemption. It might not be the way in which we're able to be made righteous, but it is the determiner. It is the determiner of what keeps us in a blessed state with the Almighty. It is the determiner of righteous living and unrighteous living. And what the Father has done by His grace, by His mercies, by His kindness, He has designed a way that those who are sinners can be made righteous through faith by coming to Messiah, 
Yahshua entrusting him that blood sacrifice. And once you come in, then the Father will give you power by his spirit. He'll give you strength and ability by his spirit to live in such a way that pleases him. He'll take his finger and write in your heart his Torah so that you can live it and you can do it. He knows us as human beings. He knows that we are weak in ourselves and he knows that we are incapable by our own ability to walk everything out by every detail. Therefore, he fills us with his spirit and covers us with his blood so that we could maintain this state of righteousness in our lives. And he does it freely. But he challenges each and every one of us to make a decision to sell out. I'm wrapping this up. There's some folk who want the benefits of the Father, and they want the benefits of the Creator, but they don't want to do what He has commanded. They don't want to follow the requirements. When folk came to the Messiah and said, hey, I want to follow you, Messiah said, if you love your life, you're going to lose it, He said, but if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Messiah said, you got to stop doing you. Oh, this generation doesn't want to hear that message. The Messiah said that if you're going to follow me, you need to take up your cross. You need to take up that crossbar. Yeah, you're going to have to live with the weight of the crossbar. You're going to have to live with the burden of the crossbar. And you will have to deny yourself. Oh, that's a message that this generation does not want to hear. Don't talk about denying yourself. They try to equate that with work salvation. No, it ain't work salvation. All the Messiah says is that if you're going to follow me, you got to give up you. You can't do life your way. He said, I'm not accepting you doing life your way. He said, come to me, all you that labor and the heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He said, but take my yoke upon you. No, we don't want to hear that message. We don't want to hear a message of being in any kind of bondage. See what the Messiah does? He breaks us free from every yoke of sin and everything that is for our detriment. But he then ties us to himself. Puts a yoke on us. And when you are yoked to the Messiah, guess what? You can't go in your own way anymore. You have to follow him. It, 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 it's, <laughs> if I could put it in these terms... You, you're in a forcible position. You have no choice but to go in the direction of the Messiah when you are yoked to him. And folk don't want to put that yoke on. Because Messiah is never going to walk in a direction that involves sinful activity. And so the message to us today, the Father out of his love, his kindness and his graciousness so that he could bring man back into fellowship with himself. He's done it all. All you have to do is come to him and deny yourself. I hate to break the news to us, but you can't get out of this thing having a plan B in the back of your mind. Can't have a plan B in the back of your mind and come to the Father. You can't have any thoughts of, oh, well, you know what, I'll just try this out, and if this don't work out, I'll go back to my old lifestyle and say, no, 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 you can't have that in the back of your mind. The Father wants all of you completely. You have to decide that, and he knows the hearts of all men and women. He knows our hearts. And he challenges us. To give ourselves completely to him. When we actually do that. That's when we actually are saved. 
and born again. Everybody that's saying, I believe, I believe, I believe is not saved. The Messiah knows it. Only those who have sold out, that have given up their life, that have given up their will, that have said, Yahshua, I give all to you. You're the ones that will be saved if you do that. And I want to challenge you the way Messiah challenged you. Come, all you that labor are heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest, but you must take his yoke upon you. And let him have charge of your life. I'm closing on that note today. I hope that those of you who have heard this teaching will respond positively to the call of Messiah. Be blessed. Let us pray.